Thank you very much, uh, Max. And uh, so, and thank you also to all of you for joining us for this masterclass. Okay, so I will start. I will start this lecture with a very brief introduction about uh, uh, machine learning methods and the sampling. Uh, especially if uh, you've attended the previous masterclasses, uh, you will be familiar at least with the second topic. And uh, then the the core of this presentation will uh, will be um, on two examples of how we can learn the collective variables that are key ingredients in many nonsense sampling. Uh, approaches directly from uh, atom, from molecular dynamics data. Uh, then finally, I will discuss uh, how to do it in practice. So how we can train these CVs, we will use the PyTorch machine learning library and how we can deploy them in Plumed. Uh, and so by using the, the recently added PyTorch module in, in Plumed. And finally, I will uh, give a few words about uh, the exercise, uh, how, to, how to run them. So uh, I am pretty sure that probably uh, most, if not all of you have been exposed to some, some ways to uh, some machine learning methods or applications. We, we can refer to them here. We just give a few words as introduction to make sure that everything, everyone is, uh, is, um, is on the same level. Uh, we can refer to machine learning uh, um, methods as, uh, uh, in general, a set of algorithms which are able to learn from data rather than from instructions. We can improve with experience, namely uh, when new data is added, and that they can be make uh, that can be used to make useful predictions about new data. Uh, one notable example, of course, are neural networks which have the nice property of being universal interpolators, so they can represent uh, functions of many inputs and many outputs with arbitrary accuracy. But these are just uh, one aspect of a machine learning approach, which is the model. The other two important ingredients are the data from which we want to learn from and the objective. On the other side, we find in a set sampling, which of course, which as you probably know very well as a set of methods which have been devised to accelerate the simulation by promoting the occurrence of rare events. This can be done, for instance, by adding an external bias potential as a function of some selected collective variable. And um, but here, actually, I want to, I want to highlight, I highlight a different thing, which is, uh, as a consequence, the target of an asset sampling methods is to collect all the relevant thermodynamically, uh, all the thermodynamically relevant data, the given condition. So, and so as such, we see that uh, that a fruitful combination of these two, of machine learning and sampling application, uh, I mean, can really benefit uh, in in both directions. For instance, we can use an unsampling to collect the relevant data, which we can feed to a machine learning model and for learning from it. Uh, a few examples uh, of, I mean, re in the recent years, uh, I, mean, I mean, several, uh, several uh, uh, application of machine learning to, an to atomistic simulations in general, and especially to an sampling uh, from the construction of machine learning potential for um, predicting the potential energy surface with high accuracy, but at a low cost with respect to quantum mechanics. Uh, then, uh, we can we, machine learning has been used to improve uh, existing enhancement sampling methods, for instance, by representing high dimensional uh, free energy surface or assisting in the construction of, uh, um, of, uh, of a bias potential as a function of many uh, input collective variables. And finally, which is also the topic of today, uh, we can use uh, machine learning approaches to extract, to design collective variables directly from, from, from data, rather than, for instance, from physical intuition. In general, uh, the, the key, as I was saying before, there are three key ingredients uh, of uh, any machine learning approach. And I think, uh, uh, I think typically one always starts from, from the model, let's say a neural network or a kernel method. Instead, uh, I think, uh, uh, Mm, one should ask, uh, I mean, we should ask ourselves uh, the following question first. The first is, which is the data, which data is available? Because depending on this, 
we will be able to ask different questions to the, uh, to the and to learn something, something different from the, from the data. Of course, I mean, it's, it's a trivial but uh, important consideration. And then we need to ask, what do we want the computer to learn from it? And especially, how do we formalize it mathematically? So uh, this, is, uh, um, this is what we can call objective, because indeed, uh, we, we are gonna, we're going to need to tell the algorithm in a, in a mathematical way via what we call an objective function, a loss function, uh, what is our target. And of course, uh, uh, one thing is, let's say, uh, training a neural network to distinguish between images of cats and dogs. Uh, but how can we tell a computer what, what, what a collective variable is? We need to find ways that also depends on the data to, to describe this, this, this problem. Finally, when we, once we have answered to these two questions, then we can ask ourselves, which model is suitable for, uh, for this task? And we could also indeed ask, uh, do we need a very expressive model? Or maybe uh, we, we want a, a more simple one, but also more interpretable that can be inspected and understand in order to understand what, what is learning. I mean, of course, these are important questions. As an example, uh, I'm pretty sure, the, the, I mean, the, most of you are familiar with, with neural networks, or at least I've seen them uh, uh, somewhere. Still, I, I just give a few words. So what are neural networks? Uh, neural networks are a class of nonlinear functions which are parameterized by a set of parameters. As I was saying, they can approximate, a, at least in principle, any function of many inputs and outputs. And uh, uh, the action of the network can be understood as a composition of uh, uh, of several layer-wise uh, uh, operations. In particular, at each node, we just take the inputs of the previous layer, we combine them with a set of weights of uh, the current layer, we add uh, an extra bias parameter, and then we add uh, what is called an activa a nonlinear activation function. So we have first a linear, and we have the combination of a linear transformation and a nonlinear one. And the composition of uh, uh, multiple such operations allow us uh, to uh, represent uh, any, uh, with, uh, with great accuracy, any function of uh, many inputs and, and outputs. The key point here is that uh, we need to understand the, the values to assign to these parameters. And this we can learn uh, from, the, from, uh, from, from the data. Typically, the training of such uh, of neural network requires multiple steps, I mean, multiple steps. And uh, which are actually composed by uh, first evaluating the function. Uh, so we can go from the input to the output. Then we evaluate uh, what what they call the what, what is called the loss function, which tell us how good it, is the prediction. And then we use uh, we use this information to compute the derivatives of the uh, of the loss function with respect to all the parameters of the network. This allows us to change the parameters in order to reduce the loss and so make better and better predictions. This is typically performed by using, um, by using uh, gradient descent methods. One simple example, let's say we want to fit, we want to fit uh, a function given some, some data, uh, we could use as loss the mean square error. And, you can, and you, as you can see in the animation here, the more iteration we train, the closer the, the, our, our, um, our function gets uh, to, the, to, the, to the data. Now we can dive into the, we can dive into the problem of today, which, is, uh, um, we, which regards several collective variable based and sampling methods. Indeed, uh, Several methods from umbrella sampling to metadynamics uh, and also other, it's I mean, and also some recent evolutions uh, rely on the identification of a small set of collective variables. And then we apply a bias potential to lower the free energy, uh, the free energy barriers along the, the, the corresponding variables. So we add to the potential energy of the system a term which depends on the atomic coordinates via this uh, uh, collective variable S. And if the variable is good enough, this procedure will lead to, um, uh, to a diffusive sampling. In particular, it will allow the system to move more easily from one state to the other. The point here is that the success of uh, 
all of these enhanced sampling methods crucially depend on the identification of appropriate CVs. Because of course, if, uh, if you have a good CV, as you can see here, we will be able in a short amount of time to simulate ma many transitions from one state to the other. But more often than not, uh, the situation we, 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 we find ourselves uh, in uh, is the following, in which uh, maybe if we are lucky, we, we, when we, we go somewhere, we uh, transition, and then we get stuck. Uh, and as you can see here, I mean, this is the amount of time is like 100. It's, uh, I mean, the, the amount of time on the simulation on the right is 100 times larger than, uh, than, um, than the one on the left. And this is because uh, identifying the right collective variable give us an exponential uh, speed up. So it's really crucial to identify them. However, uh, the problem is that collective variables typically are very system specific. Uh, in general, there is not a one fits all solution. Uh, for instance, uh, if we, uh, I mean, uh, uh, if we want to simulate some simple chemical reaction, we might use distance or contacts between atoms whose atoms are formed, but then we need to combine them. Or if we want to study, I don't know, like a solid liquid phase transition, we might uh, look at the local bond order around, uh, around each atom uh, to see whether there is uh, the formation of a, of, a, of a short and long range order. Or if we want to simulate protein folding, we might resort to quantities such as the radius of duration, root mean square distance, and so on and so forth. As you see, this process typically requires a huge amount of physical intuition along with many, many trial and error until we find the right CV or the right combination of uh, CVs, which allow us to converge uh, the, the, uh, the simulation and start the free energy and all the quantities of interest. However, the complexity of the system that can be nowadays uh, simulated uh, call for new approaches. So what we would like to do is to complement uh, the physical intuition, which is still uh, crucial with a more data-driven procedure. And in the following, we will uh, we'll see two, uh, two examples of how we can extract the collective variables from the data. The first, uh, we will try to design CVs as to discriminate between the states. Why is that? Well, before uh, going, going straight to the point, uh, we, we need to ask ourselves, OK, what do, we, what do we expect from collective variables? Well, of, in general, CVs need to be continuous and differentiable function of the atomic positions. We should be able to both distinguish the state, let's say here A and B, but also to describe the transition between them. And so they have to be connected to the slow mode of the system, uh, which need to be, uh, let's say, uh, accelerated in order to, for, for, to drive the system along the minimum free energy pathway that connect the two states. And if you want to, uh, so we said, we want to learn these collective variables directly from the simulation data. So the question is, uh, which data uh, are available? Which data we can use? Typically, let's say, I, let's imagine we want to study a new system. Uh, we will, typically we won't know anything about the, the transition from one state to the other. If, uh, in, in many cases, however, the information that we have is uh, what are the metastable states we are interested in? For instance, the, could be, I mean, this is a situation that occur often in the practice. They could be, let's say, a reactant at the product state of a chemical reaction, or the liquid and the solid uh, phase, uh, or unbound and bound uh, pose of, of, a, of a lingam binding uh, pro of a drug design problem, or um, the unfolded protein and the folded one from, and the folded configuration from, uh, let's say, from crystal crystallographic experiment and so on. So the question is, given this kind of data, which is what we have at the beginning when you want to study a new system, what we can do to design approximate CVs? Well, a simple, but it's actually all, the, the only thing we can do is to design, this, the, to design the CVs as to discriminate between the states. How can we do this? Well, here we resort to, to a statistical method, which is called the Linear Discriminant Analysis, LDA, which uh, searches for uh, a linear projection of W of, of a set of input features. Here, the, the input will be uh, physical descriptors, let's say distances, angles, but also more complex ones. You want to find a, a projection of such, uh, 
of our descriptors such that the classes, which are the metastable states here, considered the case of two, are maximally separated. How can we find this? Well, we can maximize uh, the ratio of these of two quantities, which are the so-called within scatter, uh, within class scatter matrix and the between class scatter matrix. I mean, it's easier to understand. This is, these are just related to the covariance and the mean values of the, the classes of the, of, the, of the sample in each class. And we want to maximize the ratio of the between state variance with respect to the within state one. How do we do in practice? This amounts to solving the, 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 the projection that uh, maximize this, uh, this ratio. And this leads uh, uh, to solving a uh, generalizing in value problem where the eigenvalue uh, V measure exactly the degree of separation of the states. So this can be used as a quantity, this, this can be our objective function because the, the, greater, the greater the eigenvalue will be, which amounts of this ratio, uh, and the, the more separated the, the, the states will be. Now, after having discussed about the, the data, and uh, the objective now we need to we need we, we need to ask uh, which kind of model we want to use uh, linear LD, standard uh, linear lda has been applied also to um, to the problem of uh, cv discovery however it's my limit it's my limitation is the fact that we can only find a linear combination and this uh, in many circumstances can be a very limiting factor instead here we use a nonlinear generalization of lda in which the, 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 mapping will, the, the mapping is learned uh, with a neural network. How can we do that? Well, as inputs, we imagine to, to have a possibly very large set of input descriptors uh, together with their labels, whether they belong to state A or state B. Uh, we, these inputs, these descriptors are fed into a neural network which performs a nonlinear uh, transformation into some uh, latent space. And on the output of the network, uh, we can perform LDA. We can perform LDA, which means to compute the, eigen, the generalized eigenvalue equation, uh, I compute the, and estimate the eigenvalue and its eigenvectors. And from this, we can use the eigenvalue as loss function. So we want to maximize, uh, we want to, to train the network parameter as to maximize uh, the eigenvalue of which is the LDA score. And then we go back with back propagation, we optimize it uh, uh, until we reach convergence. What are we doing in this, in, this, uh, in this way is that we are changing our input space in such a way, in such a way that the discrimination between the states is maximal. Indeed, as you can see, we started from some, some uh, input space in which the configuration were completely, I mean, which the states were completely overlapped. And so it wasn't possible to find a, a, a linear, uh, classifier between them into instead uh, a linearly separable space on the output of the NN, and then we find our CV by, projection, by projecting along the uh, most discriminating uh, uh, directions. So this is just a non-linear, this is just say, we want to perform the LDA, LDA, so we want to discriminate between the states, but instead of using a linear classifier, a linear, sorry, linear transformation, we use a neural network. So to summarize here, uh, we are using our data, our uh, unbiased simulation in the metastable states. We want to uh, fit the model, a neural network, in order to discriminate between them. How do we do it in practice? Well, we can start, we can perform short molecular dynamic simulation in the metastable states, and we compute a set of descriptors. And then we use this data to train uh, the deep LDA collective variables, and to do so, as you will see, these are the steps that you will do also in the tutorial. These are, uh, we will use uh, the PyTorch machine learning library to fit uh, for this purpose. And finally, we can take this model and use it to apply a bias potential uh, along these CVs to enhance the sampling. In principle, uh, these, uh, I mean, these the CVs can be used with any enhanced sampling methods. In the following and also in the tutorial, we will use OPS. I hope you, you, you did attend the, 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 the last masterclass. Uh, if you don't, you can always um, look it up on, on the website. Uh, we, we use OPES 
because I mean it's very similar. I mean at least in the, uh, to, to metadynamics, but it has uh, several uh, important advantages. It has fewer parameters. It quickly converges to a quasi-static regime. Uh, it can allow to bias more efficiently multiple collective variables. We can put a limit on the maximum amount, uh, the, on, the, on the maximum amount of bias deposited. We can also sample uh, different target distribution and generalize the samples and so on and so forth. Okay, so now I, uh, I start with advertisement, uh, but I think, I mean, this is actually an, an important, uh, uh, all of these, uh, I mean, having a robust and uh, sampling method is of course, uh, uh, is of course important. To make an example, here we can consider this is a toy model. This is the Buller Brown potential, which you see here. These are the, the isoline of the, the isoline of the, of the potential. We have two states which are uh, connected in a very nonlinear way. And so this is a good test also for, for, for our, for our um, application, for our method here. Indeed, what we can do is to perform MD simulation in the minima. And uh, as expected, they will, they will stay in, in the stable minima. When, when, when we take this data and we uh, train a deep LDACB, we, we can actually, first we can see what happens if we use just a linear, combi linear combination of the inputs. Here, the inputs are just uh, X and Y. Uh, what happens in the case of LDA is that we can learn only a linear uh, combination of, uh, I mean, we can learn a linear projection of these inputs. And uh, it's um, another important thing that, that should, we should be highlighted is that when then we apply a bias potential using the CV, the system will be driven in the direction which is orthogonal to the ISO lines. So in this case, uh, we will drive the system in this direction, which of course, like it's, it's, uh, it's, good, uh, it's good when we are in this state, but driving it in this direction, I mean, in the direction, uh, in the same direction also here, it's not as uh, effective. Instead, we see that uh, using a nonlinear, uh, I mean, a, a nonlinear uh, transformation to, um, to con we, we are able to connect the states uh, in, a ma in a way which, which is actually uh, able to follow more closely the, fluctu the unbiased fluctuation of the states. And this can be also uh, seen in the fact that we have a better sampling. Here you see that with deep LDA, we are able to really uh, drive the system along, uh, at least lucky I mean, in this case, because it's not guaranteed, of course, being uh, computed only from um, from the from the from data in the metastable states, but still we see that with the, the fact that the performs a nonlinear combination of the inputs allow to follow more closely the the, uh, the path that connects the two states. Uh, beyond beyond toy models, here yeah, just illustrate a, a couple of, uh, of uh, interesting application or applications. Uh, in this case, for instance, we have a chemical reaction between. Uh, uh, these two molecules being in the alcohol and formaldehyde. Uh, and the idea is that we are interested in studying the, the transition in, in, in a product in which we have the formation of a carbon-carbon bond and a proton transfer between the oxygens. What we do here, what we, we, we run as before, we run unbiased simulation of the reactant and the product. Uh, and we need to characterize uh, each configuration with a set of descriptors. Here we use, uh, this is actually a simple, but I think, I mean, the message be, be behind it's important. We, we, we can use, uh, we, we could use, for instance, uh, uh, interatomic distances between the atoms. However, it's more, it's, uh, we can use uh, what I call here chemical informed descriptors. So if we're interested in the formation of the breaking of the bonds, we can use more tailored descriptors for describing this process. For instance, we can use some smooth contact function which tell us whether a bond is formed or not. Uh, the, the, the nice thing is that in this way, we can inform uh, the, the, the machine learning model about the physical, uh, I mean, the physical aspects we are interested in. Uh, it works, uh, I mean, if you check in the, in the, in the, in the paper, it works, uh, uh, it works well, even with, with using simpler uh, descriptors such as distances, but still uh, in this way, we are like, we are able to focus the sampling on what, you're, what we are most interested in. And uh, these results in a, in a very diffusive, uh, in a very diffusive uh, uh, behavior, which tell us that the CV 
despite being optimized starting only from um, only from equilibrium fluctuations of the metastable states, is actually able to capture this concerted mechanism between between the two. And this was, I mean, this, this wasn't. Uh, um, I mean, it was. A, we we cannot keep this in general for granted. It could work. Uh, I mean, uh, but the important thing is that this uh, as uh, as. Uh, This can be always used as a first step. So, of course, we should not we should not see these variables as uh, as a way uh, of finding the best collective variables. So rather, how to make the, the best out of the limited knowledge. And if this works, uh, then uh, th this is uh, this allow us to estimate the free energy. Uh, I mean, to, to estimate the free energy as well as uh, all the other thermodynamic observables we are interested in. Another example um, is like, I mean, it has been applied to, to also to, to several different kinds of, of, uh, of applications from here you see a ligand binding example uh, in which we wanted to estimate the, the binding free energy between a, set of uh, between a set of ligands and the target molecules. So as before, we computed uh, unbiased simulation of the bound and the unbound pose. And then we, here the PLDA was used to, um, to include the effect of water into the collective variable set by using a, a set of, uh, um, by using uh, as descriptors, the coordination number of water to describe the solvation both within the pocket and, uh, 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 and around the ligand. And the, also in this case, it's been quite uh, uh, successful in, in identifying, I mean, in driving the system from one state to the other and also identifying some intermediate states. If you're interested, yeah, I reported a few more applications. For instance, it has been used also to drive the crystallization also of molecular crystals by using structure factor peaks as, uh, as inputs, as well as to study uh, biological transition of the, of the COVID uh, protease. And also, uh, it has, DPLDA has been used uh, as a step of a automatic reaction discovery workflow. And if you're interested in maybe in one, uh, one of these applications, you can check out the papers. So in summary, uh, in the first part, we see how we can use uh, uh, CVs uh, as to discriminate between the states. This is a simple, sorry, this is a simple uh, but effective way of compressing the information we have at the first place, which are equilibrium fluctuations into collective variables. Um, of course, uh, this, this doesn't give us the ideal CV, rather is the way of, to make the best out of the limited knowledge. What we want to do uh, in the next step is to uh, take this data and refine it to, to get uh, more, uh, to, to get, to, to improve the, 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 the description of the collective variables. Maybe if you have some questions, uh, I don't know, I can take, I can take them now or also later at the end. Okay, so uh, in the second part, we want to, uh, to improve on our description of the collective variables. And in particular, we would like to, uh, to go beyond the classifiers, we say, because in the, first, in, the, in, the first, uh, the first part, we started just from, uh, by, by just from the knowledge of these metastable states. But in the practice, what we would like to add is to add uh, some dynamical information, because in, in the practice, uh, in the practice, I mean, the, the situation is way more complex as we see already in some of the examples before. And we would like to, uh, to inform our CVs of the presence of maybe multiple metastable states, the transition pathways between them. How can we, how, how can we do this? Well, we can uh, resort to a, variational, uh, to a variational principle, which is called variational approach to conformation dynamics which looks at the evolution of the probability density towards the Boltzmann equilibrium distribution. And so if we consider, the, the, I mean, the, 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 the nice properties that if we consider the, the, the operator which evolves such probability density towards equilibrium, uh, we can see that the eigenvectors, uh, eigenfunctions of this, uh, of, of what is called the transfer operator are related to the uh, to the slow mode of the system. So the modes that most slowly decorrelate uh, 
uh, towards the, 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 the equilibrium distribution. This is actually also, uh, I mean, it's connect connected to the Peron Frobenius operator. And, and like when we do, um, when we do Monte Carlo, it's guaranteed that, um, uh, that only the, the leading, that only the leading eigen, uh, eigen function uh, of the of the peron operator will uh, will survive, which corresponds to the Boltzmann distribution. The point is that here we are not uh, interested in the Boltzmann distribution, rather in what makes uh, in what amper our simulation uh, what uh, from converging to Boltzmann. And this is actually the information which this the eigenfunction of these transfer operators give, give us. So, I mean, if you are interested in the theory, you can check these and many other papers. Um, they, they, what, I, what I want to, to highlight here is that these eigenfunctions are, uh, I mean, in a real event scenario, the eigenfunction of the transfer operator are connected uh, to the rail transition between the long lived metastable states. And so these are, are exactly the collective variables we want to, uh, we want to, to, uh, to identify. How can we find them? They have the property uh, of being maximally autocorrelated. So in order to find, we should, uh, we should look for a uh, function of the phase space uh, with the property uh, of that, that their autocorrelation should, uh, should be maximal. And so we can use some statistic, statist statistical methods such as the time lagged independent component analysis, TICA, uh, to find them. In particular, Tika uh, find the um, find the linear combination of the input features such that the output is maximally autocorrelated. As you will recognize, uh, this is a very similar. Um, I mean, the, 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 this equation is very similar to the uh, to the previous case of LDA. But here, rather than having a, a scatter matrices to account for the variance, I mean, to, to within the states, here we have. Uh, time lag correlation matrices. So for instance, uh, the, the element, uh, the matrix element of uh, CIJ of tau will be the time, the time uh, correlation function uh, between the descriptor i at time t and the descriptor j at time t plus tau. How can we solve this? As before, we will have this uh, generalized Eigenbelli equation, which projects the data towards the most, uh, uh, the most autocorrelated uh, uh, directions. And uh, several linear and nonlinear variants have been proposed to this problem from using kernels to Soltica to VAMP nets, uh, state free reversible VAMP nets. Uh, also, time lagged autoencoders are not the same, but they're strictly connected. Um, and also, in, in this case, we will use a neural network as an ansatz function to approximate as low modes. Uh, as you see, the, the, the approach is exactly the same as, as, as in the previous part with DeepLDA, but what changes here are the input, which here are time-lagged configurations, which need to, to come from a reactive trajectory. And uh, these are feed, uh, so these pairs of uh, time-lagged descriptors are feed to, um, to the neural network, which projects them uh, in a nonlinear way into uh, these outputs where TK is performed, and uh, which means to compute the time lagged correlation function, estimate the eigen value, uh, solve the generalized eigen value problem. And then we can use, uh, as before, uh, we can use in the loss function uh, the eigen values. So we want to uh, find, uh, uh, we want to construct a feature map of the input such that the output is, uh, um, is maximally autocorrelated. And so the, the result of this procedure is a set of, of CVs as defined as the slowly decorrelating modes of the sampling dynamics. And this is exactly, I mean, what we can, what we, what we need to accelerate in order to improve the convergence towards the Boltzmann distribution. Still, uh, the, there, is, there is an important issue here, which is, uh, Okay, we, we, using these methods, if we have reactive simulations, so simulations in which uh, the system went from one state to the other multiple times, then we can use this method to learn 
uh, good CVs, to extract the slow motion learn good CVs. But the problem is that uh, um, more often than not, uh, we need to know already good collective variables in order to have such reactive simulations. And so we found ourselves in, in a chicken and egg situation. I mean, to have good CVs, we need uh, reactive, uh, we need to have transition between the states, but we have, to have transition, we need, uh, we need to know already the CVs. So a possible way out of this, uh, out of this problem uh, is, is the following. So we start with an exploratory enhanced assembly simulation. This could be either performed with some uh, approximate collective variable or also with collective variable free methods, such as the sampling of uh, generalized ensemble, for instance, performing multi-canonical simulation, as I will show you in the, uh, in the following. We don't, we don't need this simulation to be perfect. Uh, we just need uh, to be not too far from equilibrium. And in this regard, OPEs uh, play a very important role because it really quickly converges towards uh, a, a quasi-static uh, uh, regime. We can reweight this trajectory. We can extract the, the slow modes with Diptika, which means we can, we can analyze this bias trajectory and find which are the modes which are uh, constraining it from converging to, to the Boltzmann distribution. And then once we have identified these bottlenecks, we can remove them by, uh, by adding a bias potential um, along, along these directions. Of course, uh, we need to come the time correlation function from uh, an enhanced sample trajectory. And this gives us some, uh, some troubles. What, what we can do is that we can, uh, we can consider the effect of the bias, of the, bi of the presence of the bias potential as that it gives uh, an instantaneous acceleration, which is uh, uh, proportional to the, uh, the, the exponential of, of the bias. This is actually uh, very similar to what is assumed when, when we want to extract, uh, for instance, kinetic rates from bias simulation. Uh, so this allows us, uh, by, 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 by making this assumption, we, we can calculate the time lag correlation function, not in the simulation time, but in the time rescaled by the presence of the bias potential. Of course, this is a, yeah, there is a subtle, uh, is a tricky, uh, but, but important remark to make, which is, uh, even with this, uh, even we, we, should, we should remember that uh, the presence of the bias changes, uh, I mean, especially if no uh, particular cautions are, are, are taken, uh, the, the presence of a bias changes uh, the dynamics, uh, at least in general. So what we will extract are the slow modes of the bias sampling dynamics towards the Boltzmann distribution. This might be different from the ones uh, uh, if we were to apply the same method to an unbiased simulation. For instance, uh, if the accelerated, I mean, for instance, if, we in the, if, if in the initial simulation we accelerated some variable, the signal uh, in the slow mode uh, could be not as, uh, as strong as, uh, as in an unbiased case. So the suggested protocol is to bias what we found the Diptika CVs together with the bias from the initial simulation, because in this case, we, we, we are sure that we do not lose any information. And this, uh, I mean, to avoid optimizing a multidimensional bias, we can also use the static bias obtained at the end of the previous simulation. So to sum up, uh, in the second case, uh, we, um, we, the data we, 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 we we use are reactive bias trajectories, and we want to approximate the slowly the correlating modes of the system by using a, a neural network model. As an example, we can consider the Allen and the peptide, which, uh, especially for those of you who attended the previous masterclass, I think you know already very well. I mean, this is a this small molecule is often used as a benchmark for enhanced sampling methods. And it has two states, uh, in, which are well described by the cup by the pair of uh, torsional angles phi and psi. Um, in particular, the phi angle is a very is an almost ideal CV, while the psi one is uh, is actually poor one. It's uh, often it's described as the prototypical example of a CV 
uh, a collective variable which should not be used. And for this reason, to stress test this method, we started from a simulation of an epeptide uh, simulating exactly the, 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 psi, the psi angle. And uh, as you can see, I mean, the, the sampling is really poor. We need to wait five microse microseconds before obtaining just a handful of transition. Nevertheless, when we take this data, we analyze it and we extract the diptycha uh, variables. Also here, I mean, we want, since we want to stress test this, to, to, to stress test the method, we don't, use, we don't use angles or dihedrals, which will be the best way of describing the, the system. Rather, we just use the interatomic distances as inputs. Still, when we train a network uh, taking as inputs, taking the inputs uh, uh, the, 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 only the interatomic distances, we are able to find a CV which results uh, in a much improved sampling. Here you see the, this, uh, this is the time evolution of uh, the, the fine angle, uh, and you see that we are able to observe uh, tens of transitions in, in a very small amount of time. So this is to say, uh, in the, I mean, here I mean we report I reported the the, the, the free energy difference between the two states as a function of time. Uh, in the top panel for the initial simulation and in the bottom panel for the diptycha one. And as you can see, we, we obtained really a huge sampling speed up. So here uh, we were converged after five microseconds and while here we converge in a matter of uh, as, as, as little as one nanosecond. So this is to say uh, that really uh, we, that we, it's, it's incredible how we are able to extract a good CV even from uh, such a poor uh, sampling in the first place. Of course, I mean, this, uh, if we look, if we look at the, um, if you look at the, at the evolution of the bias potential uh, with OPES, we see that it actually converges qu quite, uh, quite, um, quite fast. And this, this transition actually uh, are, um, I mean, are in a really in a quasi static regime. This is a key point for extracting some something useful. Another another example, a uh, more complex one, is regards uh, is uh, regards uh, uh, the folding of a small protein. Uh, here we will study the chinolin mini protein. This is one of the smallest protein uh, that can that has a folded structure. And since we wanted to study in a, in a way as blind as possible, we started instead of, we, instead of starting by biasing some approximate CV, let's say a root mean square distance or uh, whatever, we started with a multi-canonical simulation. This is a way of sampling all the configurations relevant to a range of temperatures by biasing and uh, biasing the potential energy. This is similar, I mean, the, the target is the same as you were to do the parallel tempering or replica exchange approaches. Uh, while here with OPES is done, uh, it could be done in principle even with a single, uh, with a single replica. As you can see, these results uh, in, uh, I mean, it's able to, to drive a few transitions, although it's not very optimal. Nevertheless, even in this case, when we, we analyze such a simulation and we, uh, we extract the CV as the slow mode of these, of these dynamics, as before, we, all, we also here use the interatomic distances as uh, input descriptors. These results, uh, so again, this is not the best, the, the best uh, way of representing, of representing the system, we might do something but this was again to to to, to see how the the using a complex and expressive model can um, can allow to, de to design cv even when starting from a, a not so optimal description and here you see in the right panel uh, that the, first of all the time evolution of this is the uh, root mean square from which we see that we see in the same amount of time we see many more transitions and this allow us to um, estimate the free energy with great accuracy and also to characterize it. Finally, the last example, just to, to show that this, this, is really, this is really a general approach that can be uh, applied to system as diverse as protein folding, but also uh, uh, materials crystallization. Here we wanted to 
uh, to improve on, instead of improving in the first example, we improved on uh, a physical uh, intuition, I mean, on a variable uh, given by physical intuition. In second, with a multi canonical, a collective variable free simulation. And here we start, we say, let's, let's start by training a deep LDA CV and see whether we can improve it. Uh, as you see here, we use, uh, uh, as we use deep LDA, and we use the structure factor PIX, which is a way to measure the presence of long range order of the three dimensional actually structure factor, which is also able to detect the orientation. So this is a very powerful, but this give us a uh, lot, uh, I mean, in principle, hundreds of, of, uh, of, uh, of descriptors. And as you can see, uh, training a deep LDA CV to discriminate between the liquid and the solid works, but it's not so, it's not so effective. When we uh, analyze this, uh, this data and we perform, we, we, we accelerate the slow mode, we see that this uh, greatly improved the sampling, but especially we see also, uh, uh, um, we see also another very important thing, which is uh, in, the, in, the in, the, in the bottom row, I plotted the, the, the deep LDA CV, the, I mean, the, the deep CV, the, the neural network based CV, the deep LDA and deep TICA uh, against the, the, uh, some quantity which measures the number of uh, crystalline atoms. And we see both, uh, uh, both CVs are able, I mean, all the deep LDA CV is, is, is able to, to distinguish very well between these two states, but it has a lot of troubles in, in the, in the in the in the middle because it, it it was trained only on the data from the minima which are here and there. Why we see that when we later feed this data to the and train a diptych variable, this is actually cor very correlated to what is the physical reaction coordinate of this process, which is uh, the number of crystalline atoms, at least for this uh, for this uh, specific system. So this is important because then once we have extracted uh, in a very expressive and maybe with using complex functions as a function, I mean, we can use this uh, deep tica to learn uh, complex CVs um, as a function of maybe also in this case, complex descriptors, but then we can also try to understand and to get some physical insight out of it. So to summarize, we can identify the, the, the collective variables as the bottlenecks of enhanced sampling simulation. So the modes that most slowly they correlate uh, and subsequently accelerate them to greatly improve the sampling. This approach can be applied to different kinds of enhanced sampling simulations uh, from CV based to generalized ensemble. And it offer us a way to systematic improving the CVs instead of proceeding by trial and, error, trial and error until we find the right combination. So I think, uh, um, and, and I show that this can work uh, even uh, starting from very suboptimal uh, simulation. If you have uh, any questions, uh, about this part, or we can do it also later. Uh, if not, I will describe how we can do this uh, in the practice. I mean, um, okay. Mm, so the idea is okay. In in the in this talk, in this talk, I show you how we can use uh, how, how we can use. Uh, um, I mean, we can design some data-driven collective variables so we can learn the CVs directly by analyzing the data. But then we, we would like also, it's a, a, a crucial point of this work is that we want to use these variables uh, to enhance the sampling. So we need to, uh, we need to put them back in, uh, for instance, in, plume, in the plumed uh, software. Uh, to, to feed them as arguments of metadynamics, opus, uh, or any other umbrella sampling or whatever. So how, how can we do this in practice? Well, the first step is the training of the CV. And for this, uh, we, can use, uh, uh, we can use PyTorch, in particular, uh, which is a well-known machine learning library. Uh, in particular, I developed a package uh, to help in this process. 
and which allow to very easily train the, the CVs I presented also in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. And then once we have uh, obtained such a model, we can take it, export it and use it and load it in Plumed using the um, using a, a PyTorch C++ APIs. So I developed a PyTorch module which can, uh, which can load these, uh, these uh, machine learning models from PyTorch. Um, so first, uh, I mean, regarding the training uh, here, you can, um, of course you could use, uh, uh, you could use directly PyTorch. Uh, here uh, I, I collected in this package all of the different code for training both linear and neural network based uh, CVs. Uh, with the focus on, uh, on loading the, the data from Plumed and exporting the models uh, in such a way that can be read uh, from, uh, from Plumed. Uh, as you can see, you can have a look also on the, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's still in development. So feel free, to, feel free to open an issue on GitHub or reach out if you find any bug or you would like to ask uh, for some uh, extra feature. And if you look here uh, on the documentation, you can see how the, 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 the code is structured. We have uh, different models uh, from linear combination to neural networks, but it's easy to implement also other ones. And these are optimized using different estimators like LDA or TICA. And, uh, and uh, then we have a lot of different utilities for reading the data, for training, I mean, so efficient data loaders for PyTorch, uh, uh, optimization uh, scheduler, and also some utilities to compute the fast and the plot plan. Just to give an idea, uh, le 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 let's assume we want to train a deep LDA CV. Uh, what we can do is just to load some, uh, some data from, let's say, a Culver file. Uh, we need to specify which are the inputs uh, and uh, X here and what are the labels. Uh, so we need to, to know to which states they, they belong to. And then we define a model. Uh, here we use a simple feed forward neural network for um, uh, with four, uh, with, I mean, with, the, with these layers and number of nodes per layer. And so we initialize the CV we choose uh, when to stop the training. Uh, you could do for a fixed amount of, of steps or iterations, or uh, here we use early stopping, which is a way, uh, so we divide the training, the, 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 the data set uh, in, in training and validation, and we stop the, the training when the validation score uh, start to, to increase. And then we can fit the model on the data. So all, uh, all, uh, all of the different functions, like the, the evaluation of, uh, uh, of the, 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 the generalized again value equation and the back propagation is done under the hood inside this feed function. You can, you can look into the manual if you're curious. I mean, you can, you can check uh, the documentation and the source code to learn how, how each step is, uh, is performed. And also if you want to do something similar. And finally, once we have, uh, uh, once we have fitted the model, what we can do is we can export it. So what, what we do here is that uh, when we export the model, we use Torch script, which is a, a PyTorch just-in-time uh, compilation. This allows to serialize the model to use it without any Python dependencies. For instance, we can deploy it in a C++ program uh, and so also in Plumed. These are, these are um, for, for, for this purpose, I developed, I, I developed a, a, a PyTorch model, which contains an interface between Plumed and PyTorch and allow us to load any uh, model uh, compiled with the Torch script uh, from, from PyTorch. And uh, this has been uh, just only recently pushed to the official Plumed um, repository. So it, you need to, to uh, to download the development version to, to use it. Uh, it will appear on 2.9. Uh, and it requires to compile libtorch against, uh, to, sorry, to, it requires to compile Plume against uh, libtorch. And so uh, it's important, uh, of course, that they 
that the, the version that has been used to export, to train the model in Python with PyTorch and the version of PyTorch, it's linked, actually, it needs to be the same for, for correctly loading the model. And uh, of course, uh, an, an, an interesting part is that we can load any function defined with PyTorch and serialized with, uh, with Torch script. So uh, it could be a complex model such as neural network optimized on data that we can train with MLCBs, but can be also, uh, this can be also used as a way of testing new CVs, especially we, because we can take advantage of the fact that the derivatives of the outputs with respect to the inputs of these uh, CVs can be computed using the automatic differentiation feature of, uh, of PyTorch. So we don't have to, this could be useful to, to test uh, new, new CVs without, uh, without having to manually uh, write down also all the derivatives as, uh, as usual in the, um, when we want to, when to implement a new, a new, a new, a new call bar. And as an example, you see here, once we have a, a PyTorch compile model, um, we, we can use it in a plumed input file as in a simple way, in, in the following way. Here, we just need to define some input descriptors here, for instance, to torsional angles. And then we use the PyTorch model keyword specifying the name of the file and which should be the argument of this function. This automatically will detect, I mean, this function will automatically detect how many uh, outputs uh, are, um, uh, are needed and will create some components called node zero for the first, node one for the second, and, and so on. For uh, regarding the exercises, as, uh, as um, as, uh, as usual, you, you can find uh, in the Plume manual uh, an overview of the tutorials and, and also the links to the data. Actually, all the tutorial and the data are, I mean, all the tutorial will be done in a form of uh, Jupyter notebooks. Uh, these, together with the data, can be found on, uh, on a GitHub repository. But since, uh, um, since, uh, um, since it actually requires a lot of different software, so we need to download LibTorch, uh, link Plumed, uh, and then patch Gromax, install Python packages. What I did uh, is uh, to create a project also on DeepNote, which is uh, a collaborative uh, data science platform where you can run uh, the notebooks and also the simulation, and where you, you will find all, um, also all the, 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 the required software installed. So if, for instance, no, sorry, I need to open it here. So what you will find, what we'll find uh, on, uh, on DeepNote will be some this project uh, within the masterclass. And uh, you will need to duplicate it because uh, you cannot use, I mean, this is actually very similar to Google Colab for those of you already use it. So we can duplicate a personal project and Okay, here now we'll say starting at, at, at hardware. Here you see you find all the all the all here there is all the software and also the data for the uh, for the tutorials, uh, which are in these uh, Jupyter notebooks here, and from which you can from which you can execute uh, the, the the cells. And as you will see, you can also run the Gromax simulations directly from here if you want. Or Richie, or... Richie, sorry if I interrupt you. I'm not. I'm not sure if you are showing something on DeepNote.com, but we cannot see. It. At least I cannot see. It. I I see your browser. I'm so okay. Were you running interactively something? Yes. Uh, it's stuck on the on the Google slide. I'm sorry. I don't know why. Okay. Let me try. Thanks for no. <laughs> let me know. Robert. So you see, I was following <laughs> closely. Sure. Okay. Better. I, 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 was, I was showing. Uh, um, I was showing. You can. Uh, okay. Let, let me. I will do it very quickly again. So we we'll, we will find in this uh, platform. Um, you will find all the necessary data 
uh, as you can see here, all the software, it's already installed. And there is also the, the GitHub repository with all the data and the tutorials. In order to execute, uh, you, you need to duplicate the process, the new, duplicate the project. And uh, once you do this, uh, you will be also able to, uh, you see, uh, starting up hardware, you will be able to it's in, initializing and installing everything. Okay, that's uh, it's working, run initialization. And once uh, it's uh, when it started, you can uh, you can follow the tutorials on Jupyter Notebook here. So this will allow you to run not only the training but also the if you want the simulation with Gromax directly from here. And uh, and then you you can go through through all the tutorials of the exercises. And uh, you can you here you also have access to a terminal you can create one uh, if you want to run gromax or plumed or whatever from um, from from here rather than from the jupyter notebook and so i think with this uh, i finished um i will be happy to take questions uh, if you have I have one question. Can you repeat how you you what is the link to get to this deep note uh, plumed? Uh, because I know you posted everything on our website, but maybe it's easier yeah, to, to get the link. I can uh, put the link on the chat and also in the Slack channel afterwards. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will do it. Thank you. Palomino, here one raise and please go ahead. Okay. Hi. Uh, so thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I have one with respect to the role of lag in Tika because normally you use this, you you increase the number, the lag value to, for example, erase some motions that are not that relevant to the system. I don't know if this has a certain issue here in this in this implementation. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the very. Appropriate question. Of course, uh, when you do, when you do, when you do, I mean, when, when you want to extract the, the, the slow modes from, let's say, an unbiased simulation, of course, uh, one important parameter, uh, and you will see also in the tutorial, um, uh, you, you see also the, this aspect in the tutorial. Uh, as you were saying, um, in, in an unbiased case, uh, you can choose the lag time to discard what happens on time scales shorter than uh, than the lag. However, when we when we do this on a bias simulation, what we are doing is to do it in a rescale time. So we are we are losing this uh, um, this physical interpretation of the lag time. So the question becomes: how, how do we know which lag time do, do we want to choose? This, this will be actually one of the exercises of the, of the tutorial. The idea is that we need to choose a lag time such that uh, all, uh, I mean, all the relevant, all the, uh, all the uh, modes we are in, the, 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 the slow modes we are interested in to, to, to recover are, have not decayed to zero on one end. On the other, we, do, we don't want to choose it as too small, it, I mean, so small that we, the, the eigenvalues could be degenerate, they degenerate. And so uh, this gives us a range of values uh, um, uh, which, from which we can choose. But unfortunately, I mean, in general, we, 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 don't, we don't have that physical uh, meaning anymore. Uh, okay, thank you. And just the second one. Uh, I understand that you are training using the BAMP to score, right? Yeah. So at the end, uh, what you are trying to get is like trying to recover as many eigenvalues as possible. My point would be like, what is the dependence of the of the configuration of the neural network to actually get more or less of these eigen yeah of these eigenfunctions? Well, I believe. Uh, uh... I, I mean, from from there is from from my experience uh, in in the in the associated paper, there are also a few tests regarding, let's say, the network architecture and the parameters. 
uh, to estimate the slow the, the, the slowest mode the the, 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 the the network is actually I mean the, the algorithm is quite robust with respect to the network architecture. We don't want uh, typically what we since our purpose is not like to identify all possible uh, modes of the system, but rather only the slowest one, which we want to later use as collective variables. So we, we are going to use uh, maybe the first, uh, the, the first two or whatever. I think that to, to estimate the, um, uh, the, the slowest modes, uh, I mean, the, the net, I mean, the, 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 it's actually quite robust with, with respect to the network parameters. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I understand what you mean. I was asking this because I, I was thinking, okay, so, I mean, if you are already detecting one of the slowest modes, you maybe would be able to get the second or the third slowest, uh, slowest second vector also. And I mean, at the same price of not having to do an MSM or this type of other heavy stuff. That was the reason I was wondering. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can optimize, I mean, we can easily optimize more than one. I mean, we can optimize as many as we want in practice. The point is, uh, of course, doing this on a, on a bias simulation, uh, it's, uh, um, I mean, the, 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 if I get it right, what would, what, if I get, so, sorry, I'm not sure if I, get, if I got the, the, your, your comment right. So, can you try? Can can you just can you repeat? Yeah, of course. So what you meant in this uh, in the sense is like you are only able to recover the recover, let's say, the first eigenvector or the second eigenvector. Is that no, is what can, you're talking? no, no, okay. No, I mean we, we are able in this framework we can recover as many as you want. The point is by optimizing instead of just optimize the, the largest eigenvalue, we optimize the first. Uh, uh, two, three, or whatever. And uh, the point is, since uh, our purpose is to use them as collective variables in the, in the, um, in, in the next step uh, to improve sampling, then typically we are focused on learning the first or the, se or the, or the first two, let's say. Uh, and from my experience, uh, uh, the, 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 the algorithm is quite robust uh, with respect. So find, the, the results we find are, are very similar when we change the parameter with respect to the, uh, if we want to find just the slowest eigen, eigenfunctions. Of course, if we would like to approximate uh, a lot more of, of uh, eigenvalues and vectors, this might require more care. Okay, great. I, I think the, the overall idea, I, I got it. Thanks a lot. Welcome. Thanks for the for the interesting questions. Other questions? I don't know if interrupting the, the streaming on YouTube might help. Might help. I will stop.